Hi, everyone. I'm Colin Mathis. I'm the gallery director here. Today, we've, we're going to have Jonathan Adams do an artist talk, who is our last uh, artist talk of the semester, who earned a BFA in drawing from East Tennessee State University and an MFA in interdisciplinary studio art, studio art from Rutgers University. His work has been exhibited in the Lower East Side 21 on Ludlow Street, the Brooklyn Army Terminal under the contemporary artist Kara Walker. Both of those are in New York. Uh, the Crosstown Arts in Memphis, Chautauqua Visual Art Gallery, Wiregrass Museum of Art, and Adams currently lives with his family in the Virginia, Tennessee area, but now actually is in Knoxville, Tennessee, right? Yeah. And uh, he also loves noodles, so yeah. here you go. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks, I appreciate you. So, in an effort to make this a lot less didactic, I won't be clicking and click, 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 and then we'll reach to the end for Q and A's. If you have a question or you see something, you think about something or something sparks in the back head, please feel free to speak up. Like, I really want this to be a conversation because I find when, I'm, when I put someone on the spot, I'm like, hey, yeah, you, with the question. And then eventually somebody else is thinking of something, you've lost something. This dialogue here is fluid, okay? So first, I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself, um, a little bit about what I did in grad school, what happened in 2020, I'm gonna tie it in with the exhibition that just currently happened, what I'm doing right now, where I'm at, and all the great things about it. Um, and I thank y'all again for just like, Taking the time out of your day, coming back here and just having to listen to me. So, the lightning gospel. I'll talk about symbols, icons, a little bit how I weave into narrative a little bit more. Um, but I really want to start back in 2018 when I started pushing my drawings a little bit more. Okay? I had had this idea of what was line, what was work. And I was really influenced by obviously comic books in the beginning, but then also other contemporary artists, how they're able to pull those emotions, tell narrative weaves. And I began to understand it was therapeutic for me. It wasn't just me making an image for an aesthetic value. Um, so I'm gonna get real personal here, but I think the world needs a little bit of radical vulnerability, okay? So in 2018, I had a really difficult time. I'd moved up to New Jersey for grad school. I was real excited for it. I was hype. Um, and I got into a mess of situations. My landlord at the time was trying to kick me out. I was losing money. I didn't have a job. I was like hustling shows. Grad school was around the corner. And I ended up being um, placed under evaluation in a hospital, mostly because I needed to talk about myself. I had to think about it. So I was there, but it was not of my own volition. I had not chose to go to this area myself. They had picked me up in the ambulance, take me there, and they had said, all right, you're going to stay here for an undetermined amount of time until you find out what's wrong with you. So I had to talk my way out of it, which I only had about two days. I missed the show. I had to get to my new opening. I still had to get my grades together. I had to pull my stuff together. So once I found my way out, took an Uber, three hours back to school from indiscriminate top of New Jersey, wherever I was, I created Faraday Cage, which is a small installation based upon the time when I was in the psych, uh, the psych ward. I had taken contraband, these little different items, pencils, crowns, anything I could, because you can't have anything in those materials. So I took them and pieces of paper and I would draw on them as much as I could from the bed I was at. I was also reading Moby Dick, which is a really strange way to like parallel to think about my obsession while I'm making my obsession, but reading a book about obsession. It was a real sort of moment for me. And I realized that I can make these journals in a very open way. I could think about it in a very direct way. How could I communicate with these drawings? How could I communicate with folks? And I began to find my language in that. So I began drawing on the walls. The walls had to be able to take precedent. There was more space there for me to utilize. And I started making other drawings that went along with this, that trailed, they either bookended my experience or the afterthoughts, including found objects, objects that I had taken from that area and kept with me. And I thought, wow, they're, they're still like really trying to do this upkeep, like 
keep clean, keep yourself pristine, work on yourself. But I found that in a way that um, I needed conversation. Art can't be made in a bubble. I couldn't just make it in the corner by myself looking over the shoulder. I just, I just couldn't do that. And I found I needed to communicate with it as I'm communicating with you all. So to take precedent of what this trauma or these moments were, I couldn't find an image for it, if that makes sense. It's kind of really, it's really difficult to put like what's trauma on a piece of paper. You can label it, everyone has their own different space for it, but mine took these forms of these really aggressive storms. Um, I'm from Appalachia, as most of you already know. Um, we have these mythical sort of storms. It's not like it is in the Midwest where like the sky opens up, but it's almost atmospheric. You're with the energy of the storm, you're with the area. Um, at the time, this is in um, the Brooklyn Army ter Terminal, Kara had said, well, we have this, I believe it was, it was like two football fields worth of a space. It was this massive warehouse. And she said, well, I'm gonna be filling up the Tate. She had uh, done the Fonz Americanus at the time. That's what she was working on while I was working on these. I had decided to make these large 13 foot drawings using my body. And I realized that drawings are more than just cool. I'm making it through this space. I can use it emotively. I can grapple with it physically and give it context with my form and then with my thoughts. And I really began to push what my drawings were. I started using shapes a lot more. This is all done in Sumi ink. Um, those small little two, three dollar bottles go a long way. I still have those same bottles today. Please invest in some, save you the world in drawing materials. So I made three of them, placed them up, had them all together, and I made two more after that. And we'll talk about why I've discontinued that series and what we're working on currently. And off the coattails of this, I wanted to have something a little bit more intimate. As these, you were immersed into the situation, you were falling into them, you were always walking up and you had to grapple with another axis. You couldn't just stand and take them in. You had to just be absorbed by them. Um, so I began, you'll forget me later. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, what are they on? They're on uh, photo backdrop paper. Okay. Great question, thank you. Um, so I started, you'll forget me later, which I always thought is a really interesting turn of these sort of emotions, how you keep people. Um, some people might forget that, might remember that song, um, somebody that I used to know by, I can't pronounce her name, Go E. But I had thought about the same sort of space. These people that were in my lives, were my cohort at the time, who had saw me go through this trauma, who had saw me go through these issues. And they were the realest people I knew. They still are today. The realest people I knew, I can give them a call today and we can go talk about all the best jazz and I can go upstate and I'm like, hey, I need a place to stay. And that's all I need to say. And, but I thought about, eventually we will forget each other. It will be a see you later. It will actually be a goodbye. And I began mining more and more parts of myself, finding the bits of myself that were unresolved, that I couldn't discuss, that I couldn't talk about, that I couldn't approach someone with. And I had wrestled with all these objects, my own sorts, and I want to place them in a way that was giving them respect, but then also showing how difficult, I, like what sort of turmoil I was going through. And this was one of the last ones I created, which was my Cataclysm series, the fifth one, uh, post these smaller works. I had to make People, people didn't want to get up close to it. It was just too much. It's just too much. They would back up 20, 35 feet, and they just didn't like it until I made them get close with these smaller drawings. They had to approach these smaller intimate works and then, as a direct opposition, fall into that. And there was this nice little oscillating play. I really enjoyed doing that. I really enjoy playing with the space when I'm in it.
I really like working on found paper recently, or I like making my own paper, which has been a really, really interesting endeavor, and sandwiching them together. I find that they don't need frames. It's a, it's a whole new framing mechanic for me. At that time, 2019, 2020 was like right there, like it was humming, and I wasn't totally aware of it. I had attributed it to other things in my own life. I was like, oh, it's just stuff that's always happening. The world's always on fire. It's always ending for somebody. And then it just keeps going. And I had this really great way of showing the, it became journalistic, which was really rare for me. And it became really hard for me to open them up because people have journals. We all have journals. We all have notes, things we don't want to see. But I thought if I could place what exactly those raw intentions to paper and then couple an image alongside that, I'm compressing every single way I can communicate with people in the most direct way possible, the only way I directly know how, aesthetically. They're very rewarding. And it's tough because sometimes people would walk through and they would read a sentence or read a paragraph and there's something there. And I go, oh, you read that. Okay. Thanks. I, and sometimes they'll offer advice. Sometimes they'll just give me a hug. And they always took different forms. It's the honesty is what people like. I, someone had told me before, um, sometimes you just have to pull the hearse back and let people smell the grave dirt. That sort of honesty. We all look for it on a daily basis. And I wanted to give that in the best possible meaning without holding back. Because I always feel there's all these superficial elements that drive our day all the time. Or we get in this rhythm, like, yeah, I'm doing great. I'm doing fine. And you know you ain't doing OK. You know it. <laughs> It's okay to be able to state that I am having a difficult time. I am going through something. And eventually I wondered, was I in the right place? But finally I began to exercise it. Whew! I began to exercise it and I finally got it out. And in that way, I believe art has saved me in a lot of meanings and a lot of, a lot of, unknown scenarios that could have actually happened to me that I refuse just by the fact of me just stating and claiming it, giving a name to it. Um, so today I'm working more towards hope. I'm working more towards honesty. I'm working more towards being an actual, true, presenting self. I try to be an open book nowadays. As real as you get me, this is how you get me 24-7 nowadays. And so to transition, to go to a little bit, I want to talk about a couple of my inspirations and a couple of other folks that have a nice narrative weave within their work that also I find a kinship towards. And stop me if you heard some folks. You may have heard some of them. And I'll tell you about some of the attributing ways that I really enjoyed their work as well. Um, also, I'll talk about a little about some things that I like in my life, um, like my hometown. It's a city. It's called the Twin Cities. It's like a city on two lines. It doesn't know if it wants to be in Virginia or Tennessee. It's a totally different place. So people are always asking me, where are you from, Virginia or Tennessee? And that was always a strange part for me for my identity. And finding where your narrative lies is difficult because there's, I also live, I'm from the Bible Belt, and there's all these Judeo-Christian um, means that come from and digging and unearthing and pulling and pulling and looking for something. It always seems like we're always looking to the past for all of our answers, but we all have all the answers like right in front of us. And then why am I not a Power Ranger, right? Like why, like that's just, like that's just like the best deus ex machina, right? You comes out of nowhere, you have this energy, but then you have to charge yourself within these moments. I found I had to charge myself within those moments. And in, it's more like finding what pulls you to be you, all right? Um, I love Mark Thomas Gibson's work, mostly for line work. 
and his political weave. Um, he's unabashedly direct. He sort of revels in it. And I find that he doesn't hold back at all. And his more recent drawings are more just completely using typography. Because I find that we end up having a lot of these rules about directness and indirectness when we're making work. Should you be direct or like maybe I give enough breadcrumbs, whatever needs to be made in that moment should be made in that moment. And just purely out of an aesthetic sense, um, I want to mention Takuko Inoue. He's the artist for Vagabond and he makes these really, really intensely just gorgeous drawings. Just from a standpoint of like intaglio, of, you're just like, this should be a print. This should be a litho in a lot of ways. Um, just alone, the story is cool, but the drawings, check them out. They're real cheap um, to find, but they're a lot of fun. And Angela DeFresne, who I find has a really great way of leaving breadcrumbs, who works in this really strange way of palimpsests, of Layering, overlayering, pushing, pulling, pushing, pulling. So everything looks ghostly, ethereal almost. And everything's in this sort of dreamlike state. And I find that's one of those perfect methods of the form matches the memory. She's working from memory, they match. And you're, you're yeah, that's exactly for me. That's how a memory would feel like. It feels dreamy, it feels spatial. It feels not here exactly. Um, on a more of a direct narrative weave and how a master class of composition, it would be Giovanni Tiepolo. I'm a sucker for his work, I'm like just a sucker for it, just how he lays things out. There's this really great way of compressing many little narratives and key points. There's a lot of articulation that goes in with the forms and especially with this one with Andromeda and Perseus, how the change, he's telling this narrative, but it's still without knowing the narrative, you understand that there's something going on. And it's a perfect way of finding out how a composition actually works and how it tells a narrative beyond actually just not knowing the narrative. Last few, uh, Francisco Guardia is really fantastic. Um, really dig his forms and I really wanted to work with black walnut ink and he's one of the main reasons why I started digging up my own pigments. So I find dirt, I find clay, I find berries, I grind them together and I make my own. Or go to Kramer Pigments, great place, I would check it out as well. Um, it's a really great way of having a connection with your materials and your earth and finding something that's specifically you. Because a lot of the times we'll go to Michael's or Hobby Lobby or um, I don't know if Jerry's Jerry's is out here in the Midwest or a couple of others. They don't feel right, you know? They feel mechanical. And it could also be the materials that you're looking towards. You may need a conversation with your materials. And Claude Lorraine, just because I, I love his forms. They're just so idyllic. And the way he uses washes are really great for me. They're just these scribbles, but then how he does foliage, he's allowing himself not to make the actual tree. You know what I mean? Like you, you'll sit there and you'll draw a tree and you'll get lost in the leaves. And we're, we're aesthetic. We value aesthetics and how the visual really like it entices us so we get lost in those little fibers, but then he forgets that and pulls back and thinks about the larger image. All right, 2020, everything hit the fan. It was wild. I was teaching drawing fundamentals at the time. I was talking, we were going through a lesson and then simultaneously all of our phones went off at the same time. We all looked at each other. And I immediately knew that we were in just for a different world. I became a therapist, which was okay because I was also in that same space with them. I had just come off this gamut of my show and I had felt I had burned myself. I had pushed myself to these limits, but I felt I came back charged. I was ready for a whole new avenue. I was ready for a whole new purpose. This was my beginning journey of hope. 
So I began really having experiences. We never have enough time to have experiences for ourselves in our daily lives. We have a schedule, we have a calendar, we have here, I gotta go here. You're on the phone, you're talking to your friends, I gotta go to my friends, I gotta go to my moms. You, we all find this way of like juggling, 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 juggling. But then I found it was just nice to hang out with my brother, like in the valley where we were raised, like growing, making things, totally divorced from art making. And I found that that cultivation really informed my art practice. I was able to cultivate myself in, in the same way a seed does. And I found that he was growing things that I haven't noticed before. He was torching these seeds. And I think it was a really great metaphor. And um, my brother's not poetic by no means, but he waxed poetic so hard. It was incredible. Um, he, we were talking about my grad school experience and how I was just having a, a floundering time, but he was taking these seeds and he was placing them in the fire, in this small little kettle, like torching them. And he goes, well, did you know this, right? And he goes, you know what? You have to put some seeds in the fire and eventually you plant them and that's the only way they work. We have to go through these trials of fire. It's like the casing for them was too tough. It was too hard to be able to crack open. So you have to torch and break the little, like the actual like exterior of it. And that's the only way. You, then you plant it and then something comes out of that. And it blew my mind because I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. This is wild. I got goosebumps from it. But it was one of my favorite moments of my life. It was a great moment I shared with my brother that day. Um, I had picked up a small residency at my um, alma mater, my undergrad. I was making a ton of things. I had all this wealth of stuff laying around and I, it just wasn't the conversation I wanted to have no longer. So I began running and this is right around um, Ahmaud Arbery. It's the life that was just rolling in, rolling in, rolling in. And we were also attached to our devices and that's the only thing I could see. That's the only thing I could see and we were all trapped in these walls and we were, there was this line at Walmart that I was just trying to go get some water, just some regular materials. People were fighting, everyone was like covering up like and they were counting folks and there were so many layers that at a certain point there's no way you can solve them. There's no way you can solve a pandemic but then solve the idea of racism, but then solve the idea of classism. And then how do you talk about products? How do you talk about pulling things together? And then I realized I couldn't solve them. And it made me feel helpless in so many ways. I thought that if these drawings weren't going to be a solution, or they weren't going to be an answer, they were going to be a moment in time of pure vibration. They were gonna sit with it. They were gonna sit with the unknown. They were gonna sit with being uncomfortable. They were gonna sit with these indoor spaces that were wrapped, like, we've all, like, the schedules, we will, like, it's a place where I sleep. I sleep there, I take a shower there, I change clothes, I may have dinner there, but then, like, I'm living elsewhere. My life's elsewhere, but I'm living. I'm living in my house, and a lot of the show, I had made more and more small drawings. Most people were like, where's your big stuff? I'm like, where'd it go? Like, where is it? And they were calling me. Friends were like, well, you were just using like 13 feet, 26 feet. I'm like, no, it's, it's this size now. Like, this is the size now. And I felt it was, I needed to show something intimate because we could always show something large and push the boundaries, but it needed to be appropriate to the moment. And a lot of my narrative and a lot of my work start with writing. I write all the time. I write how I'm feeling, I write what I'm thinking about, and I let my voice trail. And I start pairing words. I start pairing things that come to mind, that come to thought, and I let it go. It's a simple way of finding out what you're sitting with. Because we'll think, well, I want this image. Well, I don't actually. You'll make a thumbnail or you'll make five or in my case, 25, or you'll make 30, and then you're not really sitting with what you want. It may look interesting, and it may use your hands, but you're missing what you're after. It's like you're missing the mark in some way. So to really put it to a place, I wanted to make this the last safe place on Earth, 
which this was where we used to live back before, or well, earlier this year we had lost the farm. But it, to me at the time, that was the last safe place. My grandmother lived there, it's where I was raised, and we loved it. And it was a shame to see it go, but it felt like the only place, like what's the safest place on earth during a pandemic? A place with nobody around. My grandmother was safe, my family were fine, we were out there visiting, we all had masks on. So I began, making these smaller drawings. And then I had found a small gallery and she was making the, she had this little mini gallery. It's about yay big, it's about yay big. And she had done all the work for it and she invited me to the show. I go, oh, this is perfect. This is the perfect way to do this. So I began sketching out the show that I wanted to have. I began sketching out my gesture and my statement. And I wanted to place them here. I was real, I'm real particular about my areas. You know, I like to really see the space and sort of live with it for a moment and go, cool, I can, like my work can live here. I can live here for a moment. And then it happened to be. And I really enjoyed what came out of it. It was just a great conversation with somebody else who was thinking about the house, thinking about something else. I was thinking about our neighbors. I was like, how are they doing over there? It might be wild, but I wish I could help them. You just couldn't get away from TV. Ooh, man. So what have I been doing? I've been doing stuff. I've been doing a lot of things. Um, I'm still making smaller drawings. I'm still taking my time in them. I'm branching out, making larger ones where it feels appropriate. Sometimes the subject matter doesn't really require it to be small. And I really wanted to be able to give back because I thought my drawings are a great avenue. I see so many artists making, rep like making art about representation or making forms and they're changing the canon on how things work. And I thought that's great, they solve issues, but I wanted to solve issues in a more direct way. So I went, traveled the East Coast all 2021. That's literally what I did. I lived in my Jeep. I stayed there, I hung out, and I went from residency to residency, place to place, just juggling them and just living with like a box of art materials and a big tote bag to find where my place was. And I found my place in Aramont School of Arts and Crafts in Gatlinburg. This isn't a pitch, I promise. We'll talk about it if you want to talk about it later. Um, it's just a small craft school. And I was the intern before and they had transitioned me in because I really want to make, I really want to help people out find that bridge. I think finding that bridge to where you want to go is the most important thing. We always look for that and everyone always wants to promise it. And I can't really promise it, but what I can do, uh, I became the scholarship awards and outreach manager. I can give you money and you can come here and you can make art because I can understand like if I can't like build a bridge for you, I can give you some money and give you some funds and some resources so you can find a bridge for yourself. In that way, I'm finding a way to give back, but then I'm also still churning out artwork left and right. Um, I also want to share a selection of resources, which are really fantastic. Um, Burnaway Magazine, uh, they're really great folks, and so is Number Inc. They're great, they're, art, they're southern based arts magazines, but they have great conversations, they have great dialogue. Hyperallergic's always great. I love Harag Vertanian. Um, just wonderful people over there. Um, each one has a little bit of something. I, I'm always reading convos, and you don't have to always read stuffy art, like academic journals, which is great, but then after a while, it, it becomes like gobbledygook. So I would always invite you to find the conversations between your friends. So like, cool, I'm making this thing. I have no idea why I'm making it, but this is why I'm doing it, and this is why I feel strongly about it. I want to do that and sharing it in these magazines or these sources or applying for a grant to give yourself some funds, creative capital, use art store. Yo, you're at a university, use art store. It's, you're gonna be like, ah, I got it, but it's not a thing for me. It will later because you wanna see artwork later. You wanna see the tactility of them and how they look on the page or the canvas. Um, and uh, always Aramont, yeah. And if you ever want to talk about scholarships and outreach, please give me a call. I'm always around. And uh, thank you all so much. I appreciate you.